Hello all, um, welcome to Medic Alert Live Healthy Hour. We're really glad that you joined us today um, for our new um, Healthy Hour, a free series of informational events from Medic Alert Foundation. Um, we're joined today by the Honorable Dr. David Shulkin, so we appreciate you coming back today. Welcome, Dr. Shulkin. Thank you. Today, your host will be myself, Melody Howard. I am the Director of Community Alliances at Medic Alert Foundation, joined by Julie Hilton, our Vice President of Communications. Welcome, Julie. Hello, everyone. So for today's agenda, we'll be covering information about Medic Alert. I'll share some information about our organization. We'll have a date and we'll spend the bulk of our time on Q&A with Dr. David Shulkin and we'll also share some resources for you. So a little bit about Medic Alert Foundation for those of you who have not joined us in the past. Um, you may not be familiar with our services, so I'll take a few moments and share exactly what we do. Um, medic Alert is the original medical ID started in 1956 by a local physician in Turlock, California. Um, what's unique about Medic Alert is that we go beyond just an ID. Our IDs are backed by a dedicated emergency response team there 24-7. Um, this team is always standing by to relay your critical medical information to those treating you in an emergency. Medic Alert is the only nonprofit organization in the medical ID space and all of our revenues fund our emergency services and help provide IDs and membership to people in financial need. Our mission remains unchanged over the past 64 years, and that is to save and protect lives by sharing vital information in our members' moments of need. While the Medic Alert service works, um, your medical ID is engraved with the most vital medical information that first responders need to know right away in case of an emergency. They would contact our 24-7 emergency response team to get your full health record. That health record includes additional health data and emergency contacts, which we relay to emergency personnel. We've trained first responders to look for your Medic Alert ID, empowering them with vital information. It's really so important for someone to know treating you in an emergency if you have any existing health conditions, which really kind of fits in with everything that we're gonna be talking about today. Chronic health conditions really need to be known in the event of an emergency. Um, if you're not able to speak for yourself, Medic Alert will be your voice. And I'll um, share with you a little bit about our host today, our, our speaker today, Dr. David Shulkin. Um, Dr. Shulkin is the um, Ninth Secretary of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and as Secretary, Dr. Shulkin represented the 21 million American veterans and was responsible for the nation's largest integrated health system. Prior to coming to VA, Secretary Shulkin was a widely respected healthcare executive, having served as Chief Executive of leading hospitals and health systems, including Beth Israel in New York City and Morristown Medical Center in Northern New Jersey. And so with that, yeah, I'll say we're thrilled to have Dr. Shulkin back with us today. When we kicked off the uh, Healthy Hour series in April, he was our very first speaker, and um, we got such amazing feedback on how Dr. Shulkin, you were able to help us kind of cut through all the uh, all the clouds of information that are out there to really understand what was going on. So we're thrilled to have you back because a lot has happened since April second. So uh, we're, we're excited to hear uh, what you have to share about sort of what's new and what you feel like people need to know about where we are in terms of this pandemic. Great, great. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be back and appreciate how much people want to hear information and understand how they, what they can do to protect themselves and their families. And we really are living through a pretty incredible time. Uh, I don't happen to know anybody who was alive in 1918. Uh, my father-in-law is 97, but, but was born after 1918. So for most of us, this is really a once in a lifetime experience. But pandemics, as we all know, really changed the world. They changed the world economically, sociologically, we're seeing that psychologically, uh, the way we deliver healthcare, the way we lead our lives, and this one's no different. Um, there are generally about three pandemics every 100 years. The last one that we went through in this country was in about 2002 with the SARS uh, pandemic, 
uh, people don't really remember it that much because the difference with SARS as opposed to COVID is that people were infected with SARS generally five days after people de developed a symptom. So somebody would develop a symptom, you could isolate them and we were able to handle that pandemic a lot easier than what we're seeing with COVID where people are infection who are asymptomatic. And that's why I think the biggest difference is here in controlling this pandemic. Uh, the other thing to remember is, is that pandemics never last a short period of time though. Uh, even though SARS was not to the extent in the United States that we are seeing COVID, it didn't go away quickly. And so just to compare the 1918 influenza pandemic took three years to go away. The bubonic plague, which you may remember from your history, took six years to go away. So uh, it's just that most of us are tired of this and want this to go away, but the virus is just doing what it naturally does when it's in the pandemic state. And the way that scientists follow whether a virus is going away or not, or whether a pandemic is going to continue or not, is by tracking what they call the R naught or the reproduction number of the virus. What this simply means is, is that if one person's infected with a virus, how many people do they infect? So if you have an R naught or a reproduction number that's greater than one, that means for every person who's infected, they're gonna infect at least another person. Now, in general, COVID-19 has an R naught value of around two and a half. That means one person gets it, they infect two and a half others, that person infects two and a half other people and so on and so on. And you can see how we start getting hundreds of thousands and millions of people who are infected with COVID. It's not until the R naught gets less than one, so less than one person who gets infected infects another person that a virus is actually going away. And so if you look in the Northeast, or today we have three states where the infection is decreasing in Maine and New Hampshire, for example, uh, you have a negative R naught, you have an R naught value less than one, means the infection's going away. But unfortunately, most of the states, more than 35 states right now, we have infection that's still climbing with an R naught value above one. And that's really how you watch this. Now, as viruses go, COVID is actually not a really infectious virus. Take measles, for example. That has an R0 value of 18 compared to COVID at two and a half. So, so we could be a lot worse. I don't know if we lost. In the country. What's that? Okay. You're good. Just a second. Yesterday. yesterday in this country, we had 65,000 new infections. Now, that's the ones that got tested and measured, as you saw from the CDC yesterday. It's probably a magnitude of at least 10 times more people that actually have the infection than we know about or that are getting, in te or getting tested. So if there were 65,000 infections with a positive test. It's probably more like 650 thousand people who were infected yesterday. So this virus is still growing. It still has a R naught value above one and will continue to grow until things begin to slow down. There are some signs that it's beginning to slow down in areas of the country like Arizona, but for the most part, we're still seeing growth. Now, back in April, when I last addressed the group, I basically would follow the infections like I do every day. And what I had said was, was that if we ever got above 40,000 infections a day, that would be something that would start to overwhelm our healthcare system. That's when we should really get concerned. And as I said yesterday, we had 65,000 known infections. So it is not surprising that we're seeing hospital ICUs filling up. We're seeing some of our healthcare systems in areas overwhelmed. And that's just simply because the numbers are so high right now. So that is a very concerning factor and I remain concerned about our situation. Now, just a little bit about the virus itself before we get to your questions. Uh, it is just simply a piece of mRNA, a protein that is surrounded by a layer of fat, a layer of protective fat. 
And fat is very fragile. You can actually break down fat pretty easily. Once you break down the fat, you expose the protein. And frankly, just air will disintegrate that protein pretty rapidly. We'll talk about that in a second. But that's why soap and water work so well, because the detergent and soap breaks out and breaks down that fat layer so it exposes the protein. Alcohol also works, why uh, alcohol-based cleaners are so effective if they're above 65% alcohol. Now the virus spreads primarily, as we now know, through a respiratory droplet, but it can spread through direct touch, uh, less so than we had thought in the beginning. About six or 7% of infections are spread by touching something, the vast majority by respiratory inhalation. Uh, and we saw that, frankly, with that choir practice that many people remember in Washington State, where 60 members of the choir, none of them symptomatic, none of them feeling sick, got together and sang. They even did social distancing, believe it or not, but the singing, which is the forced expiration of air, uh, got 52 of those 60 choir members sick. So we can see how it is spread, even when you do social distancing. In terms of its ability to live on objects, touching it and getting infected that way. We know that COVID-19 lasts 24 hours on cardboard, about 42 hours on metal surfaces, and about 72 hours on plastic. So you want to be pretty careful. We also know that it does probably stay aerosolized longer than we had originally thought. So you don't want to shake your sheets or your towels and spread infection around because that just puts the virus particles into the air and that's where people can get infected. We also know that the virus likes dark places. So uh, sunlight, UV light in particular, tends to kill the virus. It likes to be in, in cold areas, so it stays in air conditioners or air vents. You wanna keep your nail bed short because it likes dark, moist places. So cut your nails and clean your fingernails with soap and water as we talked about. Um, I also just wanted to mention uh, a few things that we know about this social distancing. We first got our uh, information on social distancing from a spread of meningitis in school children in 1981 in Texas, where there was an outbreak of, of meningitis in a classroom. And the scientists went and they measured with a ruler that those students, those little girls, it was a girls' school, that were seated more than three feet apart tended not to get infected. So originally, social distancing was three feet apart. Then in the 1980s, uh, that actually got extended to six feet. And we still use that six feet, as you know, as, as a reason for social distancing. And six feet is generally a safe distance, but not always. We know from studies of military recruits where we studied people who coughed and sneezed. Most sneezes went about a foot and a half or two feet, and that's how far the virus went. But then there are people called super sneezers who when they sneeze, it goes 10 feet or more. And so on occasion, uh, these, these viruses can really travel. At the University of Nebraska, where they have an isolation unit for COVID, and people were in bed, sick on ventilators, COVID was actually found and, and cultured up to 26 feet away from the bed. So the virus can spread, but in general, six feet is generally fairly safe. We also know, as you've been hearing a lot about, that masks actually work pretty well. If, um, if everybody wore masks, this virus would definitely go away. Surgical masks are effective at 99% of preventing expiratory virus particles. So in other words, that's why they say masks protect other people. You wear them to protect other people because they protect 99%. Uh, in terms of protecting yourself on inhalation, when you breathe in somebody else's germs, they protect about 75%. So they're not as good at protecting you as they are at other people, but 75% of, of shielding out virus is not bad, and so we definitely recommend that. The virus can also enter the conjunctiva of the eye, so wearing eyewear in high-risk situations is not a bad idea, and that's why you see many healthcare workers wearing face shields, because that protects their entire face, including their eyes. Um, 
just a few words before I stop about testing and then about uh, vaccines and medications. Uh, testing is probably one of the most confusing areas that we've seen. Uh, unfortunately, in this country today, the tests are taking about nine days on average to get back. Uh, that's way too long. You need to test back within about 48 hours to be able to use them effectively to isolate people to prevent the spread. So our system of testing just isn't working. The tests themselves, there are two types, the types that detect the virus in themselves and then the antibody. Uh, we, we're not generally recommending antibody testing for the routine population. Uh, we don't know what it means, uh, frankly, and they're not that reliable. But the viral testing uh, we do recommend uh, for people that both have symptoms and also for asymptomatic people. But the most effective way of stopping the infection, besides wearing masks, social distancing, and good hygiene, is to ask about symptoms. People who are short of breath, have fever, cough, um, very fatigued, and this isn't just being tired, this is a deep fatigue where people really are having trouble getting out of bed, loss of appetite or loss of smell. And if you use those symptom screening to identify people, that's not a bad way of uh, protecting yourself from other people. We do know children can be carriers of this infection, tend probably not to be as many under the age of nine, but they even, even younger children can be carriers, but certainly children between nine and 18 are very effective carriers of the infection. Um, and then finally, let me just talk a little bit about um, vaccines and medications. We are definitely better at managing COVID-19 than we were at the beginning of this pandemic, although we still do not have any medications that really uh, effectively eradicate this virus. You've all heard now about the antiviral remdesivir that is used to prevent uh, the severity of the infection and it can reduce mortality and morbidity, but it does not cure the virus. We've heard about convalescent serum, serum from people who have recovered from the virus that also is effective, but it does not cure the virus. Probably the most significant uh, tool that we use now to prevent people from going on the ventilators is what's called proning, putting the person in a position where their lungs are expanded by having them sort of sit uh, almost like four with their hands and knees on, uh, with their stomach facing the bed. And that helps them expand their lungs and prevent the need for respiratory support. And we are seeing probably in the next couple of months, new monoclonal antibodies come out that may be also effective, probably not in cure, but in the management of the disease. Um, we're all following vaccine development, three vaccines now past phase one, uh, very uh, encouraging news, but certainly still much more to be done before they're commercially available. Certainly, I think, 2021 is the earliest that we will see commercial availability of a vaccine. And whether that will be more than one dose, a booster, and how long they'll be effective for, we still don't know the answer to that. So for at least the next six months, uh, if not more, we should expect that the situation that we have now is probably going to be similar where we need to be concerned about preventing and stopping the spread of this infection. So with that overview, I think I'll stop. And uh, I know there's lots of great questions that I'm eager to get to, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you for, uh, to help us get through some of those questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Shulkin. So um, we do have a lot of great questions, as Dr. Shulkin mentioned. We'll try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. Um, but we may not be able to get through all of them. So we've categorized the questions in the following categories, COVID-19 basics. Then we're gonna talk about some fact checking. So we've all heard a lot of different things. We wanna ask some questions related to that um, and then spend some time on COVID and chronic conditions. And then how do we move forward staying safe? So our very first question in the category of COVID-19 basics, um, you may have covered some of this already, but I'm confused on when to get tested for COVID-19. Who should be tested and when? And what is the usefulness and accuracy of this test? 
Well, uh, it's a great question. And by the way, you are not alone in being confused on this. I think, I think most people are very confused about the testing. So uh, as, as I did mention, uh, it is very, very hard to uh, be able to get useful information out of testing. Now, if you're able to get tests in sooner periods than that, that's good and, and certainly more useful. But you should certainly get tested if you are having symptoms, uh, cough, shortness of breath, fever, fatigue, loss of appetite, loss of smell, uh, muscle pain, um, even in some cases, GI symptoms like diarrhea. It's important, I think, to know whether you have COVID or not. I think if you've had a significant exposure to somebody with COVID and their definition of that is generally spending 15 minutes close to somebody that has been known to have a documented COVID infection, it's important to get tested to find out whether you may have been exposed. Uh, but in general, the most valuable information about getting tested are to identify asymptomatic people. So if you don't want to put somebody else at risk, uh, or if you want to protect yourself and there are people that are going to be around you, like caregivers or grandchildren, uh, I think that uh, you can get the most information by making sure that you have identified people that may be carrying this who do not have symptoms. And so uh, getting, getting tested, particularly in situations where you may be exposed to people or you may be exposing somebody that you don't want to get infected, I think is important. And so testing is good. I wish that it was easily more uh, readily available and the results could be returned. And as we start seeing home tests become available, which I expect in the next two months or so to hit the market, uh, I think it'll be much, much easier to get this information than it is today. As I said before, I do not generally recommend for everybody getting antibody testing because it's very hard to know what to do with the results or whether the results are accurate or not. So um, in, unless it's a particular situation where you think that you've been infected uh, and now you want to know whether you've recovered from that infection, you could get an antibody test and that would be appropriate. But for most people, uh, it's not necessary. So I have two follow-up questions on that, Dr. Shulkin. Um, first is, um, I've heard that there is uh, sometimes a false positive with the, uh, I guess, the diagnostic testing. And second, um, can you help us understand why the test takes so long? Yeah. Uh, well, well, first of all, um, with every test, uh, there's probably very few tests that we know of that are 100% accurate. So tests have either issues with false positives, that means that, that the test says that you're positive, but you're really not, or right. false negatives, which means that the test says that you're normal, but you really have the illness. And uh, this, the problem with our testing today for COVID-19 is there are both false positives and, they're all false, and there are false negatives. Mm -hmm. um, false positives uh, really are raise the concern mostly psychologically <laughs> that mm -hmm. people get very scared when they hear that they have COVID and they're actually feeling okay and they don't have COVID. But the one that I'm more concerned about and have much higher numbers are the false negatives because they can be really dangerous. They can reassure people who are carrying the infection that they're okay and then they feel emboldened to go and to visit with grandparents or visit with other people, and they're really spreading the infection. And the false negative rate in COVID can be really high, as high as 40%. Um, so the, the way that we think about these false positives and false negatives, the test actually works best when you get the test at the right time. And the right time to get a test is actually three days after you develop a symptom. Mm -hmm. So since it takes about five days on average after you're exposed to develop symptoms, and then three days after you get the symptoms when you should get tested, 
most people should get tested on day eight after exposure. That's mm -hmm. very, very hard to, okay. to schedule that way, and it's hard to know that. But if you get tested on the very day that you first develop symptoms, you develop a fever, so you run out and get a test, you are likely to have a 40% false negative rate. So that's why this is so confusing. The data is so hard to know about. It's why the CDC says there are many more people out there with the infection than we even know about. Got it. All right. Good. Mm -hmm. Melanie, you want to get to our next question? Yes. Um, so questions about being positive. If I test positive for COVID-19, how long am I contagious? Does it matter if I'm showing symptoms or not? And when is it safe to be around people again? Yeah. So uh, um, this, is a, this is a changing number. The CDC actually just about five or six days ago changed the recommendation on this. In general, if you have COVID and you are showing symptoms, the quarantine period, your infectious period should be up to 10 days. So so the quarantine period now for infected patients with COVID is 10 days, as long as your symptoms have gone away. The World Health Organization recommends 10 days, then an additional three days of not having symptoms. So the World Health Organization is a little bit longer, essentially at 13 days, um, but, um, but CDC at about 10 days if you have symptoms. Now, um, most of the virus is gone is not infectious after eight to nine days of symptoms. That's how we get to day 10. So about 95% is no longer infectious by eight to nine days. Um, if you are asymptomatic, you again should have a 10 day period of quarantine. So that, that generally holds. The only group that is still 14 days are people that have had exposure to people with an infection or people who have been in a high risk area, airplanes or an area where there's been a lot of infection in the community and then they're told to quarantine, that still remains at 14 days because you could be an asymptomatic spreader. And what we know, this is sort of against logic, is that there is longer viral spreading among asymptomatic people than those who have symptoms. So in China, the studies have shown people spread infection for up to 19 days who are asymptomatic. So that's why we have a longer period, 14 days, for asymptomatic uh, people that are not, have not been shown to have the infection than we are with those who have symptoms. No, makes sense. Yes. So on to question three, um, submitted by Laura and Tom. Um, once you have had COVID-19, how long does the immunity last? And if a person has COVID once, does it prevent or reduce their chance to get it again? Yeah, the, these are important questions that are still somewhat controversial in the scientific community. This past week, an uh, article came out in the New England Journal of Medicine that basically said, that there is evidence that the immunity that develops after an infection tends to be go going away after a couple months. Uh, now, what they're saying is, is that it's likely that the immunity may last four to six months and then begins to lose its potency. So that's a, that's, if that holds, that's a significant concern because that gives us an indication as to how long not only people may be naturally protected, but also how long a, va a vaccine may last if one's developed that develops a strong antibody response. So, um, so what we'd like to see is an antibody that stays potent and the same strength consistently for months and months and months and months. And many of the, uh, you know, diseases that we get vaccinated against and, and, and that we've been exposed to, like mumps, measles, and rubella, tend to have long-lasting antibody response. But it looks like in SARS-2 or the COVID virus uh, that that may not be the case and we may be seeing a decline in the natural immunity after four to six months. Uh, 
there's still probably more testing that we need to know before that can be a absolute definitive statement. Wow. But in terms of in terms of whether you can get infected again, there are a number of reports of people who have been infected again. And so we still do not know that. What I would say in just my interpretation of what we're seeing is, is that if you have recovered from an infection, you are much less likely to get infected. If you do get infected, you're probably going to be infected with less severity mm -hmm. than the first time around, but it still is possible that you can get reinfected and you can still spread the infection that second time. So you could possibly have some level of immunity, but not necessarily absolute immunity. Absolutely. Okay. So our next question um, submitted by Tina, while there's no cure for COVID-19, what are the effective treatments to avoid using respirators? Yeah, uh, Tina, I think as I had said earlier, the most effective technique right now is to do proning. This, the, this is when you're at the hospital and you're sick. So. Uh, early on, doctors thought that early ventilation, early intubation, breathing for a patient was a good thing. But we learned that's actually probably not true. Patients stay on ventilators for three to four weeks and often up to 85% never get off the ventilator. So now doctors are trying to keep people off ventilators wherever they can. Part of the reason you're not seeing a shortage of ventilators, by the way, in hospitals. And the way that they're doing that is largely by proning, by keeping you in a position to avoid you having to require intubation. But certainly some of the therapies that are now more available, remdesivir, as we talked about, not completely available everywhere, but more available than it ever has been. Uh, using that may help prevent the need for a respirator. Convalescent serum may help uh, prevent the need for a respirator. We've also seen some encouraging work on the use of steroids in terms of uh, improving outcomes for very sick patients. And then most recently, uh, this past week, a study coming out of the United Kingdom showing that inhaled interferon B, a new antiviral type of drug also appears to be encouraging in terms of its redu reduction of the requirement for ventilation and for mortality reduction. Thank you. So also on COVID-19 basics, a question submitted by Noreen, what types of longer term health problems are COVID patients experiencing after they've recovered from the illness? Well, Noreen, uh, we're still looking and trying to understand the long-term consequences. But right now, it looks like almost everything. <laughs> uh, wow. COVID, uh, as we originally thought of it, we thought of it as a respiratory illness, that it was inhaled or, or brought in through the respiratory lining, the mucosal membranes of, of, of the respiratory system, and it was largely impacting the lungs and restricted to the lungs. We now know that it it, it has an impact on the entire vascular system, your blood vessels, and that can affect almost every end organ, the brain, the heart, the skin, uh, the GI tract. And so what we're seeing now is potential long-term consequences that frankly will probably take months, if not years, to fully understand what this means. But we're seeing people with neurologic problems, we're seeing people with cardiac problems and unfortunately uh, general inflammatory problems uh, that often do result in pretty severe illness, uh, particularly from those that are in critical condition because of this. It's a generalized inflammatory response. And so uh, unfortunately, this is, looks like it has pretty serious consequences for those that are sick. On the other hand, as you know, this is an illness that 80% of people have mild or no symptoms with. So uh, we're not used to seeing a virus with this type of dichotomy of some people hardly or not impacted at all and other people so severely impacted with these long-term consequences. So it's, a, it's somewhat of a mystery virus to us, but it should be taken very seriously. 
for sure. So we want to ask a lot of questions. We actually had a lot of questions um, regarding fact checking. There's a lot of um, conflicting stories out there, conflicting information. And so I think a lot of us have a lot of questions. And so we had several folks who ask questions related to masks. Um, the good and the bad of wearing masks, are they really helping or do they cause more health problems by wearing them all day? Um, and what kind should I use? Well, um, so first of all, I, I, you know, there aren't many times that you want to simplify answers, but this one, I just don't, I, I don't get the debate. I don't know any really reputable medical professional that doesn't 100% agree that masks are absolutely essential and helpful. And the negative impact on masks, um, you know, I don't think that there is a lot of data for that. Now, I will say that um, there are medical exceptions to mask wearing. Uh, I actually have a blog, uh, shulkinblog.com, that where I detail the medical exceptions, and they're real. Uh, you know, people who have, um, you know, some respiratory conditions, people who have some neurologic conditions, people who have skin rashes around their mouth, uh, people who have cystic fibrosis. There are real medical exceptions that obviously a doctor can tell their patient that it's not a good idea to wear masks, but that's a small percentage of the population. But for the majority of us, there are no downsides to wearing masks. And if everyone will wear masks, frankly, this pandemic would be over in this country. And uh, every serious medical professional says the same thing. Now, in terms of the type of mask to wear, um, we do know a fair amount about that. Um, the one uh, masks that should not be worn, in my opinion, are bandanas. Bandanas are the least effective and frankly, um, really should not be used. Cloth masks are reasonable to use and generally effective. The more effective masks are the paper surgical masks. The reason for that is the fiber that they're manufactured with has an electrostatic current in them that are very effective at killing the viruses. And uh, they're the type that you see doctors and nurses and hospitals wear. Um, and I think that they are generally very effective. Cloth masks, not quite as effective, but acceptable. The N95 masks that people think that they're buying or, or have uh, are the most effective type of mask because they are designed to be airtight. I will tell you, almost everybody I see who thinks they have an N95 mask or wearing one, it is not a true N95 mask. If you have a true N95 mask, as I was trained in it as a physician, you have to perform what's called a fit test, an air tight fit test, which shows that no air is getting in. And that is very, very uncomfortable to wear for any extended period of time. So people who are wearing these masks that they bought on the internet called a K95, the K stands for it's made internationally, they are not made as true N95 masks. And so these cone masks or the fake N95 masks are fine to wear, but they frankly aren't even as effective as the paper masks. But cloth or the cone mask or paper mask, all acceptable, just not bandanas. I see a lot of people wearing masks that have these vents in them. Yeah. Not a good idea? No, it's not that it's not a good idea. I, I, I don't think that they offer more protection. Um, right. uh, a lot of these masks, unfortunately, the ones that are being bought over the internet are really, really cheaply made. If you take a look at some of those filters, they basically are, 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 are barely hanging in there. And mm -hmm. frankly, I'd rather just see somebody with a full cloth mask than, than those. But if it's a well-made mask with one of those filters, mm -hmm. I think that you can breathe sometimes a little bit easier with those and they're fine. So I, I don't object when I see those. 
Okay. I've seen a few folks in different places just wearing a face shield and no mask. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? Not, not very good. Not yeah. very good. So again, I have a article on that on my blog, shulkinblog.com, but, but the face masks clearly are not designed for preventing inhalation of viral particles. That's what a mask does. What the face shields do is they provide a physical protective barrier to protect your eyes and mucous membranes from a splash or a, or a direct droplet. You don't touch your eyes with your hands the way that you do if you have a face shield on. So a face shield on top of a mask does provide extra protection. And that's why you see so many healthcare professionals wearing it. Or if I were in a situation where I was doing a lot of cleaning and potentially could be splashed by something, a face shield is not a bad idea. But a face shield without a mask, you're fooling yourself and you're not providing yourself with protection and you're not providing others with protection. Thank you. So some more fact checking. Um, has more research been done about blood type and its relationship to developing severe illness with COVID-19? We do know that those that have O type blood have a natural protective factor in getting COVID-19. We don't know why, but those who have O blood, it doesn't mean that you can't get the infection, but you are much less likely to get the infection than if you have A, B, or A or B blood. Uh, and so, uh, that we know, and that's about as much as we know about that right now. There are lots of theories about why that might be, but it does speak to what I call sort of the genetic factor in uh, why some people and some populations may be more predisposed to this type of infection. Great, that's good information. I've read a lot about that myself. Um, what role do vitamin C, vitamin D, or other supplements play in COVID-19 suppression? Um, I think this is an area where people can go to the internet and get lots and lots of information about what might be helpful, whether it's certain vitamins or whether it's zinc or silver or, or copper or other types of nutrients as well. Um, there is not a lot of strong evidence-based data yet on many of these, including vitamin C. What we do know about vitamin C is that at high levels, it does improve uh, recovery from sepsis, which is infection, and it does actually help with viral infections. We're talking about doses that are pretty significant, given intravenously through IV at doses of like 50 milligrams per kilogram every six hours. So we're talking about studies that have been done in usually intensive care units where it has been shown to be helpful, as I said, in both general infection and with viral infection. So there is some reason to believe that vitamin C as an antioxidant might be helpful in COVID, but there is not clear evidence. And you know this association between viruses and vitamin C, first reported by Linus Pauling, the Nobel award winner um, for the common cold, again, another coronavirus, by the way, uh, really probably does have some you know, real factual evidence. But what doses, whether you take a thousand milligrams, two thousand, three thousand milligrams of vitamin C orally, whether that actually helps or not is just not clear. I think the other thing you might want to mention here is that I know that depending on how your how your body metabolizes different types of vitamins differently and self-administering high levels of any of these could be potentially dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's water-soluble and there's fat-soluble vitamins, and you can have overdoses, particularly of fat-soluble vitamins, and certainly some, some recommendations are at levels that, that certainly can cause harm. So, so you don't want to be going to the internet and following somebody's 
theory about how to do this. Um, I think clearly if somebody's sick enough to be in an intensive care unit and you know, you suggest to their doctors that you may want to try vitamin C and the doctor is willing to do that, I don't object to that at all under a monitored setting, but I wouldn't want to be taking very, very high levels of these doses beyond what's generally recommended because of the concern about overdosing, yes. Makes sense. So also under fact check, um, submitted by Clayton, can herd immunity be developed to COVID-19 or any coronavirus? Yeah, I, I think herd immunity is a valid concept uh, uh, in any type of infectious um, outbreak. Generally, what we say is, is that you need to have at least 60% of the population that's developed natural immunity since we do think antibodies do develop. Uh, herd immunity is a valid concept. I don't think any of us believe that we are likely to see herd immunity with COVID. We are now at, if we're at 4 million infections in, in the United States on a population of 350 million, we're just at about one and a half percent of the population. Even if you were to 10 times that, as the CDC suggested might be the case yesterday, you're still at 15% of the US population. So while some local communities may get to levels of herd community, those who have had really severe outbreaks, it is very unlikely that I think that will be the reason why this virus goes away because the US population has developed herd immunity. I just don't see that happening. At least um, if it does, it's gonna take a long time. Also, if we think that immunity it doesn't it doesn't sustain, it's not a forever immunity, right? It's a limited time, right. depending on when, you know, like you may get to herd immunity in New York, but not necessarily somewhere else. So right. I, I think that's, right. the hard, that's the thing I've had a hard time getting my head around. Yeah. So our next category of questions, COVID and chronic conditions, this question is submitted by Charlotte. Which chronic diseases most affect COVID-19 outcomes? Anything that potentially impacts the immune system, so a, a immunosuppressed condition, certainly cancer, certainly those that, that are no longer able to uh, mount an effective immune system, blood disorders, um, autoimmune diseases, which often have both excessive inflammatory conditions as well as and altered ability to fight infection. Uh, those are ones that we're most concerned about. Conditions that where people are taking medications who can uh, immunosuppress the body's response are um, often of concern. Some of the arthritis conditions, for example, that have the new immunomodulator drugs uh, put people at risk. But we also do know that other conditions uh, chronic conditions like diabetes um, and other endocrine disorders can put people at higher risk. And certainly uh, general factors like obesity. Obesity by itself is a substantial risk factor for COVID-19. So we have some questions along those same lines of um, immunosuppressed um, folks. Um, we do have people who, with Addison's disease, if they have adrenal insufficiency, are they more vulnerable to severe illness, excuse me, illness from COVID-19? Um, will they have to quarantine until there's a vaccine? Well, uh, Addison's disease or adrenal insufficiency is associated with higher incidence of viral infections and infection risk in general, so yes somebody with Addison's disease would be at higher risk than the normal population for uh, COVID-19. But it does not necessarily mean that they need to be isolated in quarantine. It means that they need to be extremely cautious when going out. Uh, I think that there is significant risk with prolonged isolation as well. So. So I think that this is certainly the time to be very conscious of staying away from groups, uh, 
keeping extra social distancing, being cautious with hygiene, certainly face um, coverings like um, we talked about, um, and uh, just not, not putting yourself in a situation where you may be at increased risk. So, but I don't think that one needs to be quarantined or isolated for months and months and months. So um, along those same lines, um, submitted by Roberta and Sherry, any specific recommendations for folks in a different condition category, Crohn's disease? Well, Crohn's disease is one of those um, inflammatory uh, conditions. Uh, again, I think that often the medications associated that people take with Crohn's disease uh, do work through immunosuppression in one sense. So if you're taking one of those types of medications, you should be extra cautious. I think, um, you know, with, with Crohn's disease itself, I've not seen specific studies on, on that increasing risk, but I would put them in the, in the higher risk category just out of sort of common sense. And I would use the same type of precautions that we just talked about with Addison's disease. So actually I'm gonna go back one. Um, these questions submitted by Sandy and Caitlin, is there any new data regarding asthma and COVID-19? And does taking over-the-counter allergy medications or prescription and asthma medication put patients at an increased risk for COVID-19? The, the study that I think has the largest number of, of patients studied who have had asthma and COVID-19 came out of the United Kingdom, out of England, um, with about 1,500 patients with asthma who, who developed COVID-19. And there was a clear association that people with asthma uh, were more likely to be hospitalized. Mm -hmm. So that when you have asthma and you, and you get COVID-19, you certainly appear to be at greater risk for more severe illness. Having said that, the uh, ability to link or lump all types of asthma as a single entity just doesn't make sense. Um, there are many types of asthma. Allergic asthma uh, probably does not have increased risk associated with COVID-19, but uh, general types of, of other types of asthma uh, probably do. So I think that, I think you need to understand what type of asthma you have, but in general, uh, you know, anything that decreases respiratory function or can cause bronchoconstriction that may lead to lower oxygen levels, um, I think you should be very, very cautious about. And the question about the um, antihistamines or the anti-allergy medications, no, I don't think, I don't think by themselves um, they, uh, they will cause any increased risk. I think the bronchodilators, the inhaled steroids may actually be helpful as a, as a preventative measure or if one starts to get a little bronchoconstriction, using those to make sure that you keep your oxygenation up as much as possible, I think is helpful. We did a session, uh, uh, I guess, in early May with the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. And one of the things they really stressed is that now is not the time to stop taking your regular medications, yeah. that keeping that allergy under control or that asthma under control is going to help if, if you do end up getting COVID. You just want to make sure that you're not uh, compromising yourself further. Good advice, yeah. Skip ahead a little bit. Um, these questions, we had several folks who asked these questions. Um, what makes diabetes a risk factor for developing severe illness or complications from COVID-19? And is there a difference in risk between type one and type two diabetes? And does it matter if my diabetes is well controlled? Uh, I, I, wish, I wish that we understood that a little bit better. We do know that there is associations, uh, I'm sure as all diabetics are told, uh, that they are at higher risk of infection. And once an infection occurs, they tend not to do as well as non-diabetics. Uh, 
in general, we tend to think that it does has, have to do with the level of blood sugar that infections generally like to feed off the sugar and that control of the glucose level it is important to do with infection. So, so I think that there can be a similar type of mechanism or pathophysiologic mechanism associated with COVID as well. But I suspect that the, the uh, answer to this probably goes a little bit deeper about things that we're just beginning to understand about the COVID infection. Um, we do know that the infection is generally brought into the respiratory system through an enzyme called the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 that lives in the respiratory tract. And that angiotensin converting enzyme is actually also uh, in the kidneys, and we know that there are relationships to the development of, di of, of renal dysfunction with diabetes and these enzyme levels. So I believe that there's probably uh, a very intricate connection between our, the way that the enzymes and the uh, body modulates under diabetes and the way that the body fights off and handles the COVID infection. So, so uh, my understanding of this is, is that we tend to see patients who do worse with type 2 diabetes rather than type 1. Type 2 diabetes is often associated with um, increased fat or obesity. And that by itself is an independent risk factor again, because we think that the uh, fat cells tend to produce some more of the angiotensin converting enzymes. So um, I still feel like there's a lot more to learn about this, but bottom line is, is that uh, diabetes does remain a risk factor. And just like what we said about asthma, controlling your diabetes, your blood sugar is important to do um, and certainly to be cautious around exposure to COVID is a good thing to do as well. Um, we have so many more questions that unfortunately we're not going to have time to get to all of them, but I do want to close with one question just because it's a hot topic and I'm sorry, Dr. Shulkin, for putting you on the spot about this, but uh, we had many, many questions about school. Does it make sense to go back to school if I have a if I have a chronic illness, should I go back as a teacher? I didn't know if you had any thoughts you wanted to share on that. Well, I, you know, this is, this is one that in some ways has gotten a little bit politicized. Um, yeah. But, but, you know, I don't think that there's a, I don't think that there's a yes or no answer here. What I, what I tell people about this is you need to take a look at the incidence of infection in the community where your school is. And if that incidence of infection is very high and there's an increasing rate of infection over the last 14 days, you should be very cautious about a school opening because uh, almost certainly, given the nature of activities that happen in schools, if there is a large number of infections in the community, you're going to see infections in your school. On the other hand, if you happen to be in the area where the level of infection is not extraordinarily high or the rate of infection over the last 14 days is decreasing, uh, I think that with proper precautions and with a commitment of everybody in the school community to take social distancing, fa uh, face mask wearing, and hygiene seriously, that schools can and should be reopened safely. So I think this is going to be a local decision, and I think it needs to be data-based, and I think it needs to be made closer to when the actual school opening is going to happen. Right. Well, thank you. I know that's a loaded question for a lot of people right now, but appreciate your insights on that. We're going to go to the end here. I just wanted to share with you a couple of things before we wrap up today. Um, if you enjoyed this, uh, you can find a lot more resources on our COVID-19 Resource Center. Uh, we've sought out all the trusted uh, sources of information uh, for people with specific chronic conditions, what that means with COVID-19, as well as 
more general COVID-19 resources. So we encourage you to check that out. We also have a whole library of uh, these past healthy hours. And some of the things that we talked about today, uh, like diabetes, heart disease, asthma and allergies, um, we have a, a whole hour long discussion on some of those subjects. So we encourage you to seek those out and uh, enjoy those past healthy hours like today. Uh, we will be having um, another healthy hour coming up soon. Uh, talking about caregiving and aging in place, you know, things have things have changed a lot in the last few months and people are thinking differently about what how caregiving works, how they help people age in place, how can I stay where I am if I don't want to go into a congregate care facility. So um, we'll have Portia Singh, who's a senior research scientist at Phillips Research North America. Her research is all around aging in place and tools for caregivers, so we're very excited to have her. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you again, Dr. Shulkin, for uh, participating today, for bringing us so much knowledge and uh, up to speed on where things stand. This is a, a relentlessly uh, changing uh, subject. So we're, uh, we're happy to, to have the, most latest, the latest information from you. So thank you. Thank you. So if you want to please hang on for a quick survey, um, I want to remind you, very important, please update your medical alert health profile and your emergency contacts. It's the information that we use to provide in the event that we're called um, on your behalf in an emergency. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll for you. If you don't mind answering those questions, that would be great, or that one question, that would be fantastic. you a few moments to finish that up. Um, but I really appreciate you joining us today for our live healthy hour. Um, take care and stay safe. And just to let you know, the uh, replay of today's session will be available uh, at medicalert.org shortly in case you missed anything. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.